Oh, solutions? Well, this is the one I was doing with you, so I'm just kidding. All right. Sorry. I only really have one coffee today. My sense humor doesn't kick into this. Okay. All right, guys, this is our one on one buyer seminar. Now, Cleo, you ever heard the term, you never bring a knife to a pen fight? You ever heard that saying? Yeah, I did that. Well, Cleo, after this presentation, you, you and your wife, Murray, will be so well prepared that you'll be bringing a bazooka to that gift. Okay, that's how confident, that's how prepared you're going to be. Okay, because there's no one in this industry that does this presentation besides my team and my company. Okay, if you have any questions at any point, you let me know. Okay. Now, this is what you're going to learn. This is what I want you to retain in this presentation. Number one, we're going to help you determine seller motivation at any time we're trying to look at a problem. I want you to understand the house values in the market. I'm going to help you identify the three types of markets in our marketplace. We're going to talk about client versus customer. We're going to talk about the three types of representation. We're going to cover what professionals you will need, Cleo, in order to make that purchase. And finally, we're going to talk about offer negotiations and the tactics that we use that are going to help you get the price that you want for the house that you want to buy. So number one, buyer versus seller. Claire, do you think it would be helpful during a negotiation knowing what the seller is thinking? Well, for sure. Man. Well, absolutely. absolutely right? How are we going to do that? Well, this is what I'm going to show you. The seller's mindset, the act of selling Cleo, is based on profit and rationality. Obviously, the seller wants the price to be as high as possible. It's a business decision. No one wants to list their house. No one wants to buy a house for 120 grand and sell it five years later for 100 grand. Right? Would it make sense, would it? Now, the seller's view of their home is often biased because they're going to look at their home objectively based on what they've spent on it. Now, the final value of their home at times is biased because of that personal attachment that they have to that property. Now, on the flip side, Cleo, the act of buying is based upon emotion. You're going to walk into that house, and as funny as it sounds, that house is going to speak to you. Okay, and you and, you and your wife, Murray, will know as soon as you walk in whether or not you want to buy that house. To be able to visualize yourself living there. Now we want the price to be as low as possible. Okay, we obviously know the seller wants to be as high as possible. Now the buyer is going to determine the value of a home based on comparables. And I use Zellers and Walmart clay, which is probably the best example. If you're looking for a 40-inch plasma and you're shopping at Zellers because I'm Canadian, I'd rather shop at Zellers because it's Canadian. But they're asking a thousand bucks for it at Walmart. They have it for $8.99. Well, this month I'm low in Walmart. It's the same thing with houses. The, there's a house that's similar to the one that you're looking at, and there's one 20 grand cheaper. Well, we're going to have to really look at that house and justify that 20 grand difference. Same with houses. Now, finally, the final value of, of the home that you purchase is going to be based on what you're prepared to pay. It's the buyer that determines the final value of a home. That seller can have the house, that $120,000 house, listed at $300,000 can't generate an offer on that property, can he move? The answer is no. So what I want you to retain is value is a matter of perception. The buyer's view of the seller's home and obviously the seller's view of the seller's home. So there's two different types of value that I want you to keep in mind. Subjective value is the position that we're going to take. Okay, And subjective value is basically what a buyer is willing to pay regardless of its cost to reproduce. Okay, the buyer is going to utilize this approach when shopping for a home. They're going to use comparable sales in regards to justify the, the price that they want to pay. Now, often in times, sellers fail to realize that market conditions in the marketplace are influenced by supply and demand factors. So in this case, sellers most often take an objective view of value on their home. An objective value is the cost to reproduce that home. Okay? A seller figures they bought it for 120 grand, they put 40 in it. It's at least worth 160, but they might have over-improved for the area. They might have paid too much for it. What if homes in the area are, are only selling for 135? It's very unlikely that he or she will be able to get that 160. And once again, sellers often fail to realize the supply and demand factors in the marketplace at the time, and that they can only get what that market can dictate how much they can get. Now, why should you know about value, Cleo? Well, there's three different points of value. Number one is we're going to talk about the real realtor's value. That's what I recommend they should list it. And what we do, Cleo, if you call me up, you want to know how much
what your house is worth, I'm going to determine your house based on four different types of comparables. First is the active listings. That's going to tell me what that house is worth based on its current competition that's on the market. If you put that house on the market, this is what these are the houses, these are the active listings that other buyers are going to look at. We're going to look at sold listings. Well, the sold listings are going to tell me one of three things. It's going to tell me what that house was listed for, what it was sold for, and how many days it was on the market. A house that was on the market under four weeks and sold under four weeks, sold for more money. Because the sooner a seller gets an offer, the less negotiating there is. The longer it's on the market, the better leverage you have in order to get a lower price. Conditional pending offers, that's going to give us an indication of what features, what area, what price range are buyers willing to put in offers on property. And expired listings, well, there's obviously houses that have expired, and there's four reasons why a house doesn't sell clear. Price, condition of the property, time of year, and it could be the realtor. Maybe that realtor only sells one or two houses a year. Okay. Now, we know the seller in most cases, this is the second approach to value, is going to take an objective view of value of their home because their view is often biased. And the, the price that we recommend is only a recommendation. That seller is going to listen to what he, he or she wants to sell. And obviously the buyer's view is a subjective view. We're going to determine value based on comparable sales, which is the four that I just talked about. Now, knowing about that type of value, Cleo, is going to ensure, if knowing what the realtor's perception of value is, what the seller's perception of value, and how you're going to help determine value <coughs> is going to make sure that you understand how houses get priced and to make sure that you don't overpay. Now, understanding supply and demand, Cleo, in the marketplace is very important. Um, supply is the amount of homes currently available on the market. Demand is the amount of qualified buyers looking to purchase. Okay. Now, there's three types of markets. There's a seller's market. A seller's market is defined by there are more buyers than there are homes available. So there's more demand in the marketplace than there is supply. On the flip side, a buyer's market is when there's more homes than there are buyers. There's more supply than there is demand. So buyers have more selection. Okay? A balanced market is when the supply and demand are about equal the same. And you'll see that type of market as it transitions from a seller's market to a buyer's market. <coughs> Now, based on the market research I've done since 2005 all the way up to 2010, I separate our year into four quarters. So as you can see from 2008 to 2009, our second quarter is prime time. Okay? And Cleo, I can tell you we're about down about 40 to 80 sales this time last year. So what? these are the market indicators in regards to seller's market and a buyer's market. Seller's market, homes tend to sell quickly because there's more buyers in regards to houses available. Rising prices, because the number of buyers exceeds the number of homes, they're going to force the prices up. Buyers usually have to pay more due, due to competing offer situations. And conditional offers are often rejected. That's when you see the cash offers come in. No conditions. Okay. Buyer's market, there's longer selling periods for homes because there's more homes available. There's not that pent-up demand. So buyers have more time to look. There's obviously fewer buyers compared to homes available. Hi, there's a higher inventory of homes. There are stabilized or declining prices because after that four to five weeks, if that seller still wants to sell, <coughs> whether or not he or she drops the price, <coughs> the price is getting reduced automatically by the buyer. Cleo, have you ever driven by a house that's had a sign on it for more than a couple of months? Sure. What do you tend to tell yourself when you oh, see that? There's something wrong with that house. Something wrong with that house, right? And would you pay more? Would you pay what they're asking or would you want to pay less? probably want to pay less. Now, buyers usually have more time to search for a home, and there's better negotiating leverage for the buyer because there's not a lot of demand. Now, these are the factors that influence the seller's market in our area in around 2006 to about the, th the end of the third quarter of 2008. That's when the big boom happened, okay? There is zero down payment mortgages, 100% financing. Now, a lot of people never were never taught the value of credit and never learned how to balance a checkbook so a lot of people were able to purchase a house with as little as a couple grand in their account okay record low interest rates made it a lot more affordable for people it was a lot cheaper than paying paying rent you had 40 year amortization 25 was the max now they extended that to 40 years 
there's buyer incentives and government rebates. Well, at the time there was uh, the uh, well, there is there's the land transfer tax rebate, which you, which you can save up to two thousand dollars. There was also the home renovation tax credit. Now, also in North Bay, the high cost of rent and the shortage of good apartments caused a lot of parents with kids going to school to purchase homes and rent out their rooms so that their kids were living free and clear. So there was an increase in demand there. Now, what happened in about August, August, September of 2008, the big collapse in the United States happened. They got rid of the 100% financing. You needed a minimum of 5% down to get a discounted rate. Zero down was no longer available, although some some uh, financial institutions did offer it. But if you wanted the 100% financing, you were paying a much higher rate. They brought down the 40-year amortization to 35. Uh, in regards to the lending guidelines, well, your beacon score had to be a lot higher. And obviously, the unemployment and economic factors in the area caused a reduction in, good, caused a reduction in demand. The benefit for you, Cleo... Well, what current what current market are we in, Cleo? We're in a buyer's market. We're in a buyer's market. Right? Great time to buy for you. Okay. Now I want you to understand who's working for you. Now, we deal with buyers and sellers, Cleo, but we really deal with two types of people. We deal with customers and clients. Now a customer is someone that we have no con no contract with. We owe them information only about a product. We don't owe them anything. A seller that is a customer is usually a private for sale, a for sale by owner. Okay, and buyers working on their own usually end up paying more for the properties that they purchase. Okay, now a customer is owed three duties: honesty, fairness, and duty of care, which we're going to cover. Okay, now a client is someone we have a contract with. They're owed six fiduciary duties. I'm allowed to give them advice and tell them what I think they should do. These are their duties owed to the to a customer. First, obviously, is honesty. I gotta be honest in the information I'm providing you about a property. So if I'm having an open house and you and your wife Murray walk in and you want to know if the basement leaks, well, if the basement does leak, I have to tell you. Okay, I can't I can't lie about the information about the property. If I know that there's something wrong with that property that can affect your decision whether or not to purchase it, I have to let you know. Okay. Fairness is number two. That's the second duty. I gotta be fair in the quality of information I provide, and I have to deal with every customer fairly. The last but not least is duty of care. I gotta make sure I'm giving you information and not advice, because there's no contract. If you act upon my advice, you get hurt physically, financially, or emotionally, but I could be held liable. Now, these are the six duties owed to the client. The first is full disclosure. Whatever my team knows, you will know. Confidence, I gotta prove to you that I know what I'm doing. Obedience. I gotta do what Clay and Murray want to do, as long as it's legal, because I'm not going to jail for you. Okay. But how I work is I'm gonna tell you how it is. I'm not gonna tell you what you want to hear. And if I think you're gonna make a bad decision, I'm gonna tell you. Is that fair enough? That's fair. Number four is accounting. Well, when you purchase a house, there's gonna be a there's gonna be a deposit check, anywhere from five hundred to a thousand. Now, I'm, I'm, I'm responsible for that money. i got to make sure I get that to where it has to go. Confidentiality is number five. What we talk about is confidential at all times, unless you give me permission to say otherwise. Last but not least, loyalty. Your interests, your well-being is number one at all times. So the fundamental difference I want you to keep in your mind is that a customer, there's no contract. The realtor only gives information. With a client, there is a contract. The realtor can then give it. Now, there's three types of representation as well, Cleo, that we're going to cover. First is seller representation. This is when the seller is a client. Okay, By signing a listing agreement, they now become a client. That realtor is working on their behalf. Okay. The, the second is buyer representation. Well, that's what we're going to have, Cleo, if you decide to work with my team. Okay. And you would sign a buyer's agency agreement. And that's the agreement there. What that agreement is stating, Cleo, is that you're going to be purchasing exclusively through our company. Okay. And the best way I can explain that agreement is, Cleo, you're in a, you're married, right? Yeah. What's your wife's name? Frank. Frank. 
So you're in a personal relationship with Fran, is that correct? With the big dumb. Okay. If you weren't loyal and committed to Fran, and if she wasn't loyal and committed to you, would, would you be in that relationship? Probably not. Okay. Well, you and I are going to enter into a business relationship. That piece of paper is a sign of loyalty and commitment from you to me. And if there's no loyalty and commitment between the both of us, because you obviously want me to do the best job possible, correct? I do. Then there cannot be any relationship. Does that mean we're married? No. That means we're going to get married. Okay. Now, with the buyer's agency, you don't pay me. I get paid by the realtor. But if you want to look at a private for sale, Cleo, where the seller is not offering commission, well, we got to work something out. Because I got a wife at home that likes nice things, and I can't work for free. Does that make sense? Yeah, kind of figures, but. Okay. This current conversation. Now, we also have the third type of representation is multiple representation. Is that, and that's when the seller and buyer are represented by the same company. Because all contracts are with the company, that means the seller and buyer are both clients. So we got to do what's best for both parties. So what ha happens in this situation, Cleo, is that it, the only information that matters is whether or not that's a good property for you. Okay? I can't disclose what that seller's willing to accept because I honestly don't know. I can't tell you how much to pay because that's got to be your decision. But I'm going to give you the tools necessary to make that decision. I can't disclose any motivation or personal information about either party because really it doesn't matter anyways. It's about the property. Finally, I can't tell you what price you should offer and what price that seller should accept. I can't disclose any terms of any other offers. But what I can do, Cleo, is provide you with the market information necessary of comparables so that you can come to your own conclusion. And I'm going to make sure that you're well protected. What a buyer will need to begin the prime process. Well, you need to find a reputable realtor. Cleo, you're doing good so far. Okay. You've got to find someone that you feel comfortable with, first and foremost. Okay. Uh, consider interviewing more than one agent. Okay. Number three is each brokerage, each company approaches the buying process differently. Make sure you find a company that's going to approach the buying process in a way that you agree with, that you're comfortable with. Now, the realtor you choose can cost or save you thousands of dollars when you buy. Now, make sure you choose an agent that's experienced and that's reputable. Number three, make your successful purchase will be largely dependent on how well your realtor prepares you. Okay? And Cleo, you're going to be well prepared. Last but not least, this is the most important. Ensure that your realtor is reachable and available. I don't know how many times I've talked to buyers that were dealing with other agents. They can never get a hold of them. Because if you're signed up to a buyer's agency, and most realtors are going to want that, okay, they will not show you properties because you're signed up to a buyer's agency. There's three questions I ask. If you call on one of my properties, are you pre-approved for financing? And are you currently working with a realtor and have, do you have a buyer's agency? And if you do, have a nice day. Because I can't tamper with the contract. Now, how we work is there are four of us on our team. If you have a problem, you call us. I don't care. If you can't get a hold of me, leave me a voicemail. I will call you back as soon as I can. If I'm off, I will have a member of my team take good care of you. And they're really well trained. Number two, you need to get pre-approved for a mortgage. And this is what I want you to know. I need to know what your interest rate is and your term. I need to know the amount you're pre-approved for. I need to know your amortization for your mortgage. Is it an open or closed mortgage? I need to know whether or not you're paying that bi-weekly, monthly, or weekly, and so on. I need to know that information, Cleo, because part of my job is to educate you and make sure you're getting the best possible rate possible. And I also need to know what your comfort zone is on a mortgage. If I have that information, and we find the house that you want to purchase, we can crunch the numbers in regards to the mortgage, the down payment, the utilities, the taxes, the insurance, and so on and so forth, to make sure that you got a nice house, but you still have the money to enjoy yourself. I don't want you being house poor. Okay. Third thing is, is you're going to need to get house insurance. A lot of people use the uh, insurance company that is uh, doing their car insurance. Part of my job is to educate you as well too. Now they're going to need to know certain 
number of information about the house. They need to know the age of the house, the age of the roof, the age and type of heating system, the type of wiring and amp service, square footage of the home. If there's a wood stove, is it wet certified? Is there any metal or galvanized plumbing? Uh, or is it copper, plastic, or cast iron, and so on and so forth. Number four, I strongly recommend getting a home inspection. There's two types of defects in a home, Cleo. There's Latin patent defects. Defects you can visually see, and defects you can't visually see. The defects you can't visually see are the ones you want to worry about. Now, home inspection is not a warranty of any sort. These guys will go in, they'll visually inspect everything. They usually have a pretty good eye. Okay, so it'll give you the opportunity to make sure there's nothing major that needs to be addressed right away. Finally, you, you need to get a lawyer. Okay, we don't need the lawyer until everything's firmed up. But he's going to have to search title, okay, and make sure there's no liens on the property, and he's going to make sure that everything is good to go prior to closing. Now, understanding the offer process. In this case, I just go through the offer, explain all the clauses. Now, once the offer, throughout the negotiation process, Cleo, there's three things you can do. You can choose to accept the offer, counter, or reject it. Okay. Now, the irrevocable time that we previously talked about is the time frame that one party has to do with the offer. Now, any time that the offer is countered, it's like it's a new offer. Okay. So if I present you, I'm the buyer, you're, you're the seller. I present you with the offer. Okay? You choose to counter it. No other offers can come in until that time frame is up or until we make a decision. If we choose to accept it, the offer is locked up. If we choose to counter it again, Cleo, it opens it up for any other offers to come in. Okay? Now, once the offer is accepted, we have to agree, the seller and the buyer, on four specific things. We have to agree on the price, we have to agree on the closing date, we have to agree on the inclusions and exclusions, and we have to agree on the conditions. If one of those four is not agreed to, we don't have a binding contract. Now, once the offer is accepted, these are the list of forms that we may have to fill out. An amendment to the agreement of purchase and sale is allowing us to insert and delete items out of the offer. Let's say we have to change the closing date. Well, that's a form that we would fill out. Okay. What if uh, a notice of fulfillment is stating, because your standard offer is going to be financing, insurance, and home inspection. Once that time limit is up, you have to fill out a notice of fulfillment to waive those conditions so that you can get the house. A waiver is stating, look at whether or not those conditions are done, we're removing them from the offer. Notice to remove condition is, let's say there's an escape clause in that offer, Cleo. Well, we have the five days, but if we have a 24-hour escape clause in there, if an other offer comes in that gets accepted, we now have 24 hours from the time that, that was accepted to remove all your conditions. So that's the form they would provide us with. Mutual release is a form that we would fill out after the offer is accepted. If we can't come to an agreement, uh, then we sign a mutual release, you get your deposit back, and we move on to the next one. The next step is we get your house sold. <coughs> or we... Find a house. Find a house. The only cost to you that I ask is.